Hello YouTube, Happy New Year, it's January the 2nd, uh, the rain stopped, it's beautiful, the sun's out, the roads are still damp, but uh, I'll take that. Today I'm making a tribute video to a one Thomas Edward Lawrence, or T.E. Lawrence, or Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, Lawrence has always been of interest to myself and my family, there is a family link there, and being a keen motorcyclist as Lawrence was um, and myself I thought I'd do this little tribute video of some of the key places uh, if you want to uh, follow the Lawrence train. Funny this road's been quiet for about 10 minutes and as soon as I start talking a load of cars turn up. <laughs> hey but that's showbiz. Um, so yeah, uh, I hope that you'll enjoy it. I'm going to put some uh, information on there, uh, most of which is freely available um, on Wikipedia and other internet sites. Um, so there's nothing new or groundbreaking in there, but I just wanted to do it as a motorcyclist perspective. And I uh, hope you enjoy it, and Happy New Year to everyone. Our journey in Wareham. We're probably going to end it in Wareham. It was said that Lawrence really enjoyed the uh, town of Wareham. It's a very, very ancient uh, town. Uh, the town as it is today was built by the Anglo Saxons, but there's evidence to suggest it goes back further than 4,000 years old. shame we're having to ride into the sun because uh, I know this is going to get a little bit washed out on the GoPro. Thomas Edward Lawrence was born in Tramadoc, Carnarvon, in North Wales in 1888. Before the outbreak of the First World War, he worked as an archaeologist and photographer in the Middle East. He became very familiar with the region and strongly identified with the Arab people. Before the war, Britain had maintained a long-standing policy of support for the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. However, this ended with Turkey's support of Germany in November 1914. Looking to take advantage of the growing Arab nationalism in the area, 
certain British elements encouraged and supported leading Arabs to revolt against the Ottoman colonial rule. These complex negotiations were still underway when Grand Sharif Hussein, ruler of the Hejaz province, which is now part of Saudi Arabia, started an uprising with an expectation of British support. This uprising would become the Arab Revolt and it was led by and fought by Sheriff Hussein's four sons, Ali, Abdullah, Faisal and Zaid. Lawrence had been dispatched to Arabia to identify which of the sons would be the most successful leader and so the most used to the British. He was very impressed by Sheriff Faisal and was formally assigned to him as an advisor Lawrence stayed with Faisal for two years and helped him to lead the Arabs north from the Hejaz to Syria. Faisal was advised and influenced by Lawrence and successfully seized the city of Akaba on the 6th of July 1917. From Akaba, Lawrence went to Cairo and met with the newly arrived General Sir Edmund Allenby, the leader of Britain's Egyptian Expeditionary Force. They agreed that Faisal's Arab forces would be very valuable in supporting Allenby's campaign in Palestine. Faisal's Arab forces' separate actions against the Turks did prove very useful to Allenby's forces. They attacked the Turkish lines of communication and sabotaged the railway that led to Palestine, a crucial Turkish supply route. They also cut telephone wires, forcing the Turks to send wireless messages which the British could intercept. By harassing and pinning down thousands of Turkish troops, they prevented them from concentrating against Allenby's advance. Lawrence was involved in many of these activities and at the forefront of many vital victories. He was with the Arab troops that entered Damascus along with Allenby's forces on the 1st of October 1918. Lawrence claimed the fall of Damascus as a victory for Faisal and left the Middle East shortly afterwards. As soon as he returned to London he began to work for Arab independence. After the armistice in November 1918 it was agreed that Faisal and Lawrence should represent the Arabs at the upcoming peace conferences in Paris. However, British and French leaders had already agreed privately on the future of Turkey's Arab territories in the 1916 Sykes-Picot Agreement. The Middle East was to be divided into British and French spheres, leaving no place for independent Arab states. Although he had been unsuccessful in his mission to promote the Arab cause, Lawrence became the most sought-after man in London. The American journalist Lowell Thomas's touring production with Allenby in Palestine celebrated Lawrence's success in the Middle East and portrayed him as the attractive and charismatic leader of the romantic Arab guerrillas. It seems Lawrence originally welcomed the publicity, but over time he came to despise it and attempted to distance himself from his public persona. He worked as an advisor to Winston Churchill, then Colonial Secretary, in 1921 and joined the Royal Air Force, the RAF, 
under a pseudonym in August 1922. He was soon identified and asked to leave. He then went on to join the tank corps, again under an assumed name, before he rejoined the RAF in 1925. He then wrote a book about his experiences in the Middle East, known as the Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Lawrence retired from the RAF in 1935. Soon afterwards he was involved in a motorcycle accident near his home, which was Clouds Hill in Dorset. He suffered severe head injuries, and my add he was not wearing a crash helmet, for in them times it was not compulsory, and not normally the done thing. And he died in hospital six days later, on the 19th of May, 1935, aged 46. After his death, his reputation continued to grow, and in 1962, a Hollywood blockbuster, Lawrence of Arabia, was made about his life, starring Peter O'Toole. But his reputation also came under attack, with questions being raised about the nature of his involvement in the Arab activity and how important he really was. However, the release of secret British archives in the 1960s and 1970s provided additional evidence of his wartime activity and seemed to support many of his claims about his role in the war in the Middle East.
So unfortunately Clouds Hill is uh, closed at the moment till February but we can certainly get a good look at Lawrence's home, his beloved home, the home he said he'd never leave, hence why there is stories of his figure being seen in the window, swishing his robes. Not particularly safe walking along here because the uh, sun is in your face. And there is Lawrence's beloved home. <coughs> Clouds Hill. Very modest little home. I believe there wasn't even a toilet in there. But up in that top window is uh, allegedly uh, where people have seen an image of Lawrence. I mean, you're always bound to get these sort of ghost stories, aren't you? So on the morning of May the 13th, 1935, Lawrence would have got on his beloved Bruff Superior. Conditions were said to be wet and damp. Um, and as we know, he enjoyed his bike and he enjoyed the power and performance of it. And unfortunately, he was injured literally just a short way along here which we're just about to recount for you as you can see it's a straight road being wet there could have been leaves here's a house could have been leaves on the road who knows there was only two young boys there it was said that he lost, he couldn't see the boys through a dip in the road and the only dip I know of, although it could have changed, is this one here before the actual accident site. Um, so it's probably here, who knows, I mean, there's a bit of speculation. But there's a memorial here. You see how close it is from his home? It's literally less than a minute. Um, on his bluff it was probably 30 seconds. Such a shame. That a man that went through so much got injured so close to the home that he loved. But I'll show you the, uh, the memorial. So Lawrence's fatal accident was somewhere down there a few hundred yards away perhaps didn't die straight away he um he died six days after but this was a this is a memorial on the side of the road so it says near this spot lawrence of arabia crashed on his motorcycle and was fatally injured on the 13th of may 1935 this tree was planted on the 13th of May 1983 by Mr. Tom Beaumont, who served with Lawrence in Arabia as his number one Vickers machine gunner. Oh, 
and there's a few few little bits left over obviously I think in uh, on the time of his uh, accident you get more bits and pieces left here but it's, uh, it's, it's kept tidy and then literally um, just behind is the edge of the Bovington tank testing area it's a vast area of Heathland where they put tanks and various other army vehicles through their paces they even hold rallies um, uh, here I was fortunate enough to ride with the Future Terrain charity team and their dusters here. It was an amazing experience. But anyway, we will now go on to the final resting place of Lawrence from here.
two room there on the left hand side but has now shut down and there was a, a lot of lights and video in there. Just around the corner is uh, what is known as the new graveyard uh, for St Nicholas's Church. Uh, this is where Lawrence is laid to rest. His grave was easy to find. Uh, just through the gates and walk up to the end of the short path there. You can't really miss it. The headstone reads the following, to the dear memory of T.E. Lawrence, Fellow of All Souls College, Oxford, born 16th of August 1888, died 19th of May 1935. The hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. The funeral of Lawrence took place at St Nicholas Church, just around the corner from the new cemetery. There was dignitaries such as the Right Honourable Winston Churchill and Mrs Churchill, along with George Bernard Shaw and many famous other people. In October of 1940, the church suffered severe damage when a bomb fell into the churchyard close to the north wall. RAF Warmwell was then situated where the village of Crossways now stands and it's possible that the bomb was intended for the airfield. The church was all but destroyed with no glass whatever left in any of the windows and the whole of the north wall was in ruins. A photograph taken at the time is shown here. For the next ten years, during which the people of Morton worshipped in either the hall or Morton House or the village hall, the church stood unused until restoration was finally completed in 1950. The windows were then of semi-opaque glass and the church was reopened with a service of rededication and thanksgiving by the Bishop of Salisbury.
What makes this church actually stand out is the windows. Uh, they never were replaced with um, the traditional stained glass windows, but the artist Whistler engraved them. Unfortunately, the day I visited, there was a lot of mist on the windows, so it's not very clear. You can see the engravings, but um, on a nice day, when there isn't mist or condensation in the glass, uh, they are beautiful to look at. Next stop today is where my family connection comes in. I just want to thank my auntie Deb Lockwood for writing this information um, and leaving it uh, for the next generations to understand our links. This is memoirs from my uncle Clive Taylor and uh, that's my father's brother and I will read it as he wrote it. While the unrest in Europe was smouldering, my family enjoyed the tranquillity of Dorset on their numerous holidays, staying at the rising sun at East Knighton near Winfrey. Now I must point out that the uh, rising sun is no longer the rising sun, it's now known as the Countryman Inn. The rising sun was the public house of my grandfather Jesse Blandermere. All his eleven children were born here, Lawrence of Arabia visited it often, and when he was stationed at the tank corps in Bobbington. He obviously knew me, but I was not old enough to realise I knew him. If my grandfather considered that he had enjoyed too much of his liquid refresh refreshment, and that it was unsafe for him to return to Bobbington on his motorcycle, he called two of my uncles into the bar. They were instructed to wheel his motorcycle into the coach house and shut it in, then call the local taximan to convey him back to camp. The original bench seat that he used to use is still in the same place in the small bar off of the main bar. Now, that's what I'm going to read from it. I don't know if that bench is still there because the pub is gone through further alterations and I know that um, Deborah had this letter they actually had it in the pub there for a while the last time I went in there was hardly anything left which was a shame but uh, I think once uh, a pub chain gets hold of it we're not that bothered about the history anymore
countrymen in, all the rising sons that were known in Lawrence's day. I have seen some old photos and actually the cafe next door, the Rainbow Garage, um, had some photos in there I'm sure at one time. Um, the barn at the far end apparently is where Lawrence would keep his bikes. So not only after he's had a few, but I was always led to believe that when he went away for an extended period of time, he would keep them in there for safety. Because there wasn't really anywhere safe at Clouds Hill to keep them. Um, I haven't got any photographic evidence of that, but I would uh, love to come across it one day. But there it is. Um, I was also led to believe that my father was offered the pub um, when he finishes national service but he couldn't uh, raise the funds to buy it. Obviously in today's money it would be ridiculously cheap. But uh, yes, that's the, uh, that's the family link. This is a Saxon church of St Martin on the Wolves in Wareham. Come and have a look what's inside. Although, as you now know, Lawrence is buried at Morton, uh, Kennington produced this effigy in the late 1930s as a tribute to the memory of his friend, and it was placed within St Martin's Church, which stands close to the house where the great man once lived. He also created a Bonds Buster Lawrence, which housed in the crypt of St Paul's Cathedral in London. In the sculpture, you can see Lawrence portrayed wearing Arab dress robes and a kefir, which uh, he'd been encouraged to take up during the war to both survive the harsh desert climate and to integrate culturally. In death, Lawrence holds his curved ceremonial dagger, known as a jambia in Yemen, which he had been presented by one of his friends, Sheriff Nazir, at the ferocious battle of Akbar when victory against the Ottomans was achieved. It really is a beautiful, beautiful effigy and well worth a visit, although um, the church may only be open at weekends, um, certainly through the winter period. I was lucky it was open on the bank holiday Monday, but please check first. <laughs> 